and this is episode 105 of This Week in Grip. I'm joined by Alan T. Heineck Esquire, James Professor Crowbar Retoritas, and our guest Gary, the Monster Pit Stewart. He's one of today's top benders. We're counting down the days until the Living Legends of Grip contest, which goes down September 6th and 7th at Derniat Strength in Worcester, Ohio. Now, before we get to talk to our guest and see what's going on, let's run down the very important list of bullet points. you got to hit the like button. That's number one, guys. That really helps out the show, so please do us that favor. Subscribe to the channel and click the bell so you get notifications to your phone and your email address every time we put out a new episode. We're going to be touching on a bunch of different topics today, so if you have an opinion, go ahead and leave a comment to let us know what you think. It's also been a while since we heard of any grip feats that took place in movies, so if you've got one of those, go ahead and throw that down in the comments section too. And by all means... Copy the link and share this video all over the place because you know the first rule of grip sport. You tell everyone about grip sport. We're going to hear a little bit from Alan and James. I just want to say thank you once again to uh, Mike Rinderly for meeting me last week in Harrisburg to get a good training session in. And then also yesterday, thank you to the Wailusing Valley fire department for letting me be a part of the carnival and make an attempt to pull a fire truck got it about halfway before my shoes totally totally turned heel on me you get it gary you get that (laughs) they turned heel on me all right way to jump in there bro excellent all right the double i hope hope the rest of the show goes a little bit better than that monster pit okay (laughs) okay that's about all I've got. Uh, Alan, what have you been up to, brother? What's uh, Share with us some of your uh, highlights from the last week. Oh, well, just uh, just started a new training cycle with some with some grip things, trying to get more specific for King Kong. I've uh, I've been really swamped. I've taken a, a, a new job. I'm going to be a, an instructor at a technical college in my hometown. Oh, great. So that has been... It's it's been a lot to to start getting ready for school starts in just a few weeks. We've got a whole bunch of in house stuff, so that is occupying a, a ton of my time. So I'm a little behind on on social media and stuff, kind of well, trying to get caught up right Alan, now. Alan, whatever would make you leave the adult entertainment field? <laughs> <laughs> well, that would have been a weak point of mine anyway. So. Oh. <laughs> and I don't you have the have name the for it. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's that's cool, man. Uh, what, when you're gonna, what, you have started the job, or you're going to be starting? I'm, I've I've started there, but first day of class doesn't happen until I believe it's September third, first first Tuesday in September, right after the right after the holiday. So it'll be a big big change of pace. I've uh, you know I was unfortunately forced to kind of do this in one form or another, just to, you know my my health issues I've had over the last you know a year and a half or two. It's uh, it's time to stop, you know, lifting heavy things over my head over and over again and, and take a different role. You know, but I'm excited about it. You know, it'll be neat. I always wanted to teach, and it, this was a good opportunity. Awesome. It doesn't come up very often. Yeah. So. Cool, man. Well, congratulations. That's exciting. We look forward to hearing more about it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. yeah and what about you, James? Too. Uh, not much. I would like to make an announcement first. September twenty first. Ooh, let's yes, hear it, brother. Yes. yes, on September twenty first, the pickup artists, Gary Stewart included, will be running the Off Island Grip Strong Wrestling Power Games at the new and used gym store in Statesville, North Carolina. We had a switch of location because they decided to sponsor the event. So we will be at the new and used gym store in Statesville, North Carolina at their giant warehouse. We'll have five events, 20-millimeter block set grippers, Euro pinch, two-and-a-half-inch crusher, iron mine hub, and lever top. Um, The way we're going to do it is you can pick three of the five events to compete in, and it's a records comp. So, I mean, we don't have any awards planned or anything, but uh, I believe last time, and Gary could correct me if I'm wrong, um, Janelle did provide us kind of surprises with some Gift certificates. Those of us who placed. Um, yeah. So 
Yeah, yeah, she did. So, so yeah, there was uh, different amounts and stuff. I forgot what the totals were, but different places got different amounts, and uh, yeah, it was pre- actually pretty cool. And I think Bob won most of them, and like never went back. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> Bob the Ringer. Yeah, yeah. So, so we'll all have we'll, we'll also have a uh, arm wrestling. We're gonna have Highland Game events, like probably do the fifty-six pound weight throw for height and chief and stuff like that. Um, we'll I, I guess we can use the parking lot for some of the, the throwing events too. Um, we're gonna have uh, the Denny Ring, the Highland Ring lifting. We're gonna have Husafel Stone, thanks to Gary, and Atlas Stone lifting, uh, thanks to Pork Chop, who's gonna be bringing his stones. We're also going to have bending, tearing, and all other kinds of uh, chicanery and tomfoolery going on as well. So um, I want to run this by you guys, what you think about this as a slogan for the event. Um, The Arm Highland Grip Strong Wrestling Power Games. Show up, have fun, or fuck you. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) Is that good? That's perfect. Oh, yeah. Get that on a shirt, dude. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just thinking about it because of the whole thing with Andrew last week. You know, show up to Legends or you're a pussy thing. You remember that thing? So I was thinking yeah. about oh. that. I was like, well, that, you know, that had a little bit of a ring to it. Maybe we can uh, add something <laughs> like that to our event. So, so yeah. And And just one more thing, by the way, guys. Uh, did strike a deal with Mr. Andrew Penke. He's going to give me an inch dumbbell to come up there and announce Legends and help him run his event. That's great, brother. That's, That's great. That's awesome. a sweet deal. Nice. So I might be riding up with one Gary Stewart. I've got to figure that oh, out. Oh, yes. Still. Have you decided yet if you want to compete or just announce? Oh, I don't know. Like, if it's, I don't know if I want to, like, throw another $100 to have to compete personally. <laughs> but that would be cool. I think that would be cool. I'm definitely going to consider that. You know, yeah. no, my, my two and a half inch or my two and three eighth inch axle pull from yesterday was kind of pathetic. So <laughs> just squeeze harder. Yeah. Squeeze harder. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's I can't do anything with that axle. Yeah, it's way out of my league. So, mm-hmm. but no, I mean, you know, if I'm there and, and, you know, there's an opportunity to compete, I don't, I don't see why not. I just don't want it to interfere with the, the job that I'm being paid handsomely to perform right so, so if that is All the right. case if i am able to compete i will hell with it so well, so anyhow good. gary Stark. that's good man i like i've always said dude from the i think like from the beginning i said that you would be great at uh commentary for grip obviously you already have experience with arm wrestling so I think the well, dream would, team would be yeah. you and uh, Mighty Joe, but it's uh, we need like a, a heel commentator in there that like starts pointing out people's uh, mistakes and uh, making fun of people. I think in order to get everything, uh, you know, one hundred percent complete. Well, anyone let's throw some names out. My, yeah, I was gonna who say would be the third? One of my arm <laughs> well, I personally events. think I would probably be the best one, but I'm I'm definitely <laughs> competing. So that's uh, double duty's a little a little hard to. Uh, well, Jed, you, you can come over and share my microphone if you want at some point. Like, if you want to come over and <laughs> make a statement, you know, the mic will be open for you. <laughs> All right. You're well, welcome. We might be able to make that work. <laughs> yeah. I, dude, this is like, this is the second time in less than a year that I'm crossing paths with, with uh, Monster Pit. I think we might have to have a side showdown at some point. Let's do it. <laughs> we can have a chop off. Dude. Dude, I am all about a chop off. I've already had a chop uh, off with somebody, and it, it bored me. It bored me. So I want really a seasoned a seasoned pro. That's right, brother. Okay. I think that's a great idea. All right, so okay, good. Tell the non-informed what a chop off is. A chop off? You don't know, what, <laughs> Alan? Jesus! This I didn't say it was me. Basics, dude. This is the basics. <laughs> okay. I, I realized that the NWA didn't make it up to Wisconsin a lot back in the day. All right. That's established. But <laughs> well, my gosh, dude, you guys had to have have to have had TVs. My gosh. I watched, I watched Kung Fu growing up. I didn't watch wrestling. Well, dude, well, get on it, bro. It's called YouTube. It's all on YouTube. 
I'll give you my <laughs> WWE Network password. A chop off, Gary. You take it. You're the pro wrestler. Tell them what a chop off is. Well, essentially, it, sometimes you can do it during a match. It's really a good way to initiate some younger guys and some rookies. You literally just trade chops. One guy chops the other guy. That guy chops him back, and you just go until somebody quits or gets knocked out. Um, I'm oh, undefeated. Okay. It's uh, it's a lot of fun. It's uh, it really is fun. It's a good way to bond with your fellow wrestlers and see who's really can back up how much they can talk. Sure. Nice. There you go. <laughs> so it's like a full contact kind of thing. And it it can get bloody. Sweet. It'll draw well, blood. Yeah, you gotta, you, It'll draw you blood. You got a video of that. <laughs> yep. You know, Gary, I've had a guy cut me open before. I, I was yeah. working a guy, uh, and he chopped me so hard, the pinky side of his hand literally cut open my chest, and some blood started coming down. That's awesome. And that was, you just, know what might that be was just one chop. Maybe one that of those one slap chop? competitions. Yeah, that was one chop. Wow. Well, if everybody doesn't know, this is Gary Stewart talking. He used to be a, an actual professional wrestler, journeyman around several different uh, federations in the South, I believe. And oh, yeah. uh, that's actually how I first met Gary. In fact, Gary, I don't know if I ever told you the story. I think I told James one time, but you, when you and I first started emailing, you, you were emailing me as the Monster Pit, right? Yes. And yep. there was maybe a year, maybe a year or two where you and I didn't talk. And then all of a sudden, you and I began emailing about, I think it was Raiding Grippers. Uh-huh. And all of a sudden, this guy Gary Stewart emailed me. And I'm like, okay, this, this fellow Gary Stewart wants me to rate his grippers. So this is the way I remember it, Gary. I had no freaking clue that it was you. I didn't know <laughs> that you – I think you had told me what your name was, the uh-huh. first era of emailing. But, yeah. you, know, I'd, that's, you know, I'd rather just call you by your wrestling name. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. So, uh, oh, yeah. You know, it, like, kind of freaks me out when people call, like, CM Punk, Phil Brooks. It's kind of, like, seems disrespectful. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, oh, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, so I actually uh, didn't realize who I was dealing with when I when I raided your grippers <laughs> back in, like, 2014. Sorry, bro. Now, I never heard that, but that's funny. Um, I've had the nickname Pitt before I got into wrestling. That's been my nickname since I was 14, and I, there's – Oh, man, so many people that never even knew my real name until I got on Facebook. And I started trying to add friends, and people were like, you know, who the hell are you? Like, oh, I'm Pitt. <laughs> and uh, even family members call me Pitt, and where I work, uh, they call me Pitt. There's now, less pause, people that know me as right Gary there. than Pitt. Pause right there, Gary. Now, Alan, do you know yeah. what Pitt is? P-I-T-T. Do you know what Pitt is? No, I don't. Son of a bitch, Alan. I know what? I'm terrible, aren't I? Oh, it's, Gary, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe if memory serves, which is always questionable with me, but you you got the name from the comic book character, right? Yes, correct. Okay, very good. So tell people about that, please, if you will. All right, so Pitt, the comic book, it wasn't very popular, but I liked it. He's a um, The easiest way is he's a half-human, half-alien hybrid. He's a big, evil-looking monster guy. He's not quite as strong as the Hulk, but he's one of the strongest comic book characters they made. And uh, he came to Earth. He got jumped by a bunch of bikers. He beat up the bikers, wrapped his arms and his legs in chains, and put on the biker jacket, and he had long black hair, and he went about doing good things and helping out a boy named uh, Timmy that shared his same um, – it's kind of hard to explain, but like his same genes, basically. Um, and at the time, I was 14, 15 years old. I was uh, six foot one, 300 pounds. I always wore a bunch of chains. I was, I was a biker, black jeans, black jacket. Actually, when I had hair, I had a long jet black ponytail, which the character Pitt does. And my uncle's big into comics, and he said, you're trying to like Pitt, aren't you? And I said, who's Pitt? So he showed me the comics, and I started reading it, and I never liked my name Gary, so... I started going by Pitt, and more people started calling me Pitt. And then I started going to concerts, and I was always in the mosh pit, so I just became Pitt, and it stuck. 
That's a great story. Dude, Alan, I mean, don't, I don't, you know feel enlightened? Is, uh... don't you feel enlightened, Alan? Isn't this like well, a game changer day for you? Well, it sounded like he was going to talk about like, Terminator for a second with the coming down and beating up bikers or something like that. Wasn't that Arnold Schwarzenegger's big entrance in Terminator yeah. back in the day? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was in the first one. Yeah. yeah, the human, then half-human, human, that... half-alien hybrid thing. Seems like just about a lifelike uh, comic book right there. <clears throat> <laughs> that was a joke. My bad. My bad. <laughs> um, well, somebody, Alan, why don't you shoot a question at Gary, and I'll stop talking for a minute. I'm sorry. All right, so how did you uh, how did you stumble into grip sport? Um, well, I got into doing strongman stuff about 10 years ago, and I always had a good grip. And what I kind of attribute it to is everybody was using straps, and I was pretty broke. I didn't have any extra money, so I didn't feel like buying straps. So my whatever I was deadlifting, whatever I was shrugging, my grip had to hold it. And when – there's a guy that brought a uh, Cat McCrush number three to the gym one day, and I almost closed it. I got it, I mean, within like a quarter of an inch of closing it, and I knew nothing about grippers. And I, I saw these big metal Cat McCrush grippers. So I went and ordered some, and uh, I was able to close the one out the package. I, almost, I got the two after a couple months. And I, to actually get my number three took me like four more years of training. But uh, that led me into grip sport, and I started meeting people, and that led into bending and just snowballed from there. Oh, okay. Yep. All right. And then Gary and I met on Craigslist. Yeah. <laughs> They've oh, since then taken down the personal section. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what happened was Gary, Gary was uh, selling his, his iron rolling thunder, right? Wasn't he rolling thunder? Yeah, it was my original Rolling Thunder. Yep. And I had had one previously, and it got all jacked up. And I remember I wrote an email to to Randall Strassen saying that it stopped rolling, and he got, like, really defensive with me. So I was like, well, whatever. You know what I mean? So so that somehow (laughs) made it in the garbage. Mine. But then I saw yours for sale, and I was like, huh. I was like, let me, uh, you know, let me hit this guy up. And I met Gary. Gary was working at the hospital at the time. I met Gary over at the hospital. We were just kind of hanging outside talking for, like, forever. And then, uh, gosh, it was probably a week or two later you started coming by to train over at Bob's, right? Yeah, because I I wasn't making any progress with grip stuff. I didn't know how to program for it. So I got frustrated. I was selling off a lot of stuff, and then I met you, and um, you were telling me about Bob and training and how you all work it. And um, I was like, well, I'm in – you know, I live right outside of Charlotte. I can drive to Charlotte for good training, and I met up, and that's uh, what started the – that was about the time the Charlotte pickup artist started, and uh, just – it really helped me get me on track with grip, and I've learned so much and been able to progress way past where I was stuck at back then. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think, you know, so our, our listeners know, like, Gary is a serious candidate for being able to – to bend a gold nail, and I know yesterday you said you were going to try to bend one this morning in doubles. How did that go? Yeah, I tried it. I was able to put like a five-degree kink in it, but I couldn't get it any past that. I'm uh, I'm so close, it's very frustrating. I can uh, kink one in single pads and double pads, and I can crush it from 130 degrees down in single pads, I just can't get a good deep kink, and I can't get through the sweep. But um, yeah. I can do some three eighths cold rolled steel in singles, and I can do um, three eighths twelve L fourteen in um, one iron mine and like half of a suede. But I just can't do an actual gold in the uh, iron mine and half of a suede yet. But I'm I'm so close; it's very frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. Are you willing to tell people about sort of the process that you went through, how, you know, you and Aaron kind of linked up and, and all that, or is that something you want to hold for now? Yeah, sure. Um, I actually, uh, bending was hurting my shoulder, so I sold off all of my bending stuff and I got out of it. And I wasn't, I wasn't bending right. I was just bending whatever. I wasn't really planning. And I kept my original pads and I kept some reds. And we planned, we were planning on going to Gritmas. So I, I was just curious if I could still bend a red because I never certified on it. So I walked into my bedroom, didn't warm up or nothing, wrapped up a red and just crushed it. 
And I was like, well, I can still bend. Let me do it at Gritmas. So, of course, I certified at Gritmas, and people started asking me when I was going to do the gold, and I met up with Aaron. And um, me and Aaron kind of had the same ideas on how to trim down the middle of the bars. Um, so you actually take a piece of 3 eighths, but you trim the middle down to 5 sixteenths or um, 9 30 seconds, 11 30 seconds, whatever, and you slowly work up. So that way you're working with the same length and the handles feel the same. It's just the middle of the bar gets thicker and thicker and thicker over time. So that's what I've been doing to work on my kink. And then I, I have a big vice. I've been pre-kinking them so I can work on my crush. So I'm working my crush up while I'm trying to get my kink stronger, and hopefully one day it'll meet in the middle. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I wow. mean, r- rather than, than giving any information about plans to search or anything, how, how far off would you say that you think you are based on how you it's, progressed? I'm within the variance range, as I would say. I cannot do a gold, but I can do um, – 12 L14 steel and other cold rolled steel, but depending on where you get it from, some are a lot easier than others, but that's just the variance of the steel. So I am that close. I'm within the variance. Iron mine, the gold nail, the real gold nail are just so much harder than any other steel I can find at other places. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I think that's the, that, the really cool thing, and I think it's one of the reasons why we wanted to have you on too, Gary was that um, we saw the, the, the video that you had posted where you got the new batch of golds, which were, were yeah. certainly softer um, than, than the, the normal golds, and you posted a couple of videos of you, you know, bending them in under certain conditions. Now, how would the, the, the new batch of golds compare, not to the old batch of golds, because we know we're, they're, they're nowhere in the ballpark, but, but to some of the other steel that you've bent that maybe is a little bit above the new batch of gold? Well, the uh, the new ones, I, I uh, kind of nicknamed them the fool's gold. Um, <laughs> just just to kind of help differ- differentiate. Um, they're about 55% of a true gold. So they're, it's, it is harder than a red, but it is nowhere near an actual gold. I was able to melt one pretty easy in single pads in 20 seconds. Um, but I got, um, you know, people that went back to Iron Mine, and he, Iron Mine got in touch with uh, Don Cummings and got in touch with me and whoever ordered golds recently and said, hey, this is a mess up on our end. We got in the wrong steel. We'll send you real gold nails to replace all these. And so they sent me a whole other package of free gold nails to replace the uh, ones that are too small. They ended up measuring uh, 2364s instead of 3.8s, and they, to me, seem like hot-rolled steel instead of cold-rolled. It's a, it's a huge out-of-the-ballpark difference. Okay. Yeah. But I think, for, they're, you know, I think they're pulling them. Yeah, I think they're pulling them. They're not going to send them out anymore. It was a complete mess-up. They're not going to keep these as the new ones. It was just a complete one-time mess-up. Yeah. So, Gary, so, <laughs> um, but, real quick, just, just so everybody knows, so quick on measurements. So 2364 is actually 164 of an inch smaller than a 3 8 right? 3 8 would be 24 64 Yeah. Okay. Correct. And then, um, shit, what, what else was I going to say? Um, what, are the, what are the dimensions of the gold nail supposed to be, first off? It's supposed to be 3 8 inches thick and 8 and 3 8 inches long. Okay, 8 and 3 8 um, so they're a little bit uh, skinnier, a little bit, uh, le- you know, thinner. And then are the, is the length the same? I thought someone told me they got cut at the wrong length as well, but maybe I got missed. Yeah. When I measured mine, it measured eight and a quarter. So it was a little bit short. But some of the real golds have been coming a little bit short as well. Um, I have some of them that are eight and three-eighths, and I have some of them that are eight and a quarter. So it was a little short, but I think that's how they're cutting some of them now. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's good information. Yeah. I, I, know, I just know that there's people of all experience levels that listen to the show, and they may not be super familiar with the, the gold nail. Now, you said that okay. uh, the fool's gold nail, the, the error bar, was about 55% 
of the difficulty of the true gold nail. Um, and do you believe that an experienced bender would be able to see that in a video? There was an obvious problem with the bar being bent in the, the other individual's video that put the, the video up there. Um, do you believe an experienced bender would be able to see that outright and think something was not legit? Oh, yeah. I mean, I would hope so. As, as soon as I saw it, I, I almost laughed. I'm like, there's no way that's a gold. Did he spray paint that or what? Right. Um, it just it went so quick, and you look – if you look at the guys that have bent a gold using double pads, it still takes them two or three minutes. Mm -hmm. The first person that's going to bend a gold under certain conditions is barely going to get it under a minute. You know, nobody's going to come out here and just crush it in 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. um, you got guys that are struggling to get it under three minutes, and there's only what four, five, maybe six guys that have even done that. So for a guy to come out, and, oh yeah, here this is in 15 seconds. And if you look at the actual bar, it was the bend was more round. It was like a U shape versus a V shape, which Thank is you. Yeah. the, Thank you the difference up, between right? yeah hot rolled steel bends like a U, cold rolled steel bends like a V. Mm -hmm. So when he came out, it was like 15 seconds, and it was bent like a U. I started laughing. I'm like, that's not a gold. Come on. Right. Very good. You're probably like the fifth or sixth person that's that said that as well. Uh, yeah. About the, the shape of the bend, since the you know the completed bends have been posted, and you can see that there's it's a big rainbow versus a almost like a a crotch in a tree or a V shape with the with the cold. Yeah. Rolls. All right. Very a good. Thanks for letting me tree. interject there. <laughs> a crotch in a tree, tree, baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Gary, um, <laughs> so uh, legends. You know, are you, uh, you know, because you'd signed up a, a long time ago for Legends. Uh, you know, I know a little bit about your, your training, and, and one of the things that surprises me about Gary is that in everything he trains, he seems to consistently go up. And I'm not saying, like, you haven't plateaued and stuff before, but, but you are, you're really good at consistently going up and training a lot of different things. Um, what has your training been like for, uh, for Legends? Oh, well, thank you. Um... Yeah, I've, I reach out to a lot of different people, and I talk to as many people as I can. I'm not afraid to email somebody out the blue and ask them for training tips and ask them for help. I talk to Jed a lot, and I know I ask you a lot of questions and ask Bob a lot of stuff. And I try to approach my training from different angles. I don't do the same thing over and over and over. I switch it up. I try different techniques. Um, you know, with the inch training, I try sliding it, I try using magnets, I try trampolines and rubber bands, and I'm always trying to mix it up and think of things differently. I, you know, I just don't want to be repetitive and keep failing the same way. I want to try a new way to fail and improve. Um, yeah. But I've been training a lot. I've trained for uh, four hours today before the call. Um, I just try to simulate the contest and what the events are, and I train really heavy and train almost to exhaustion for that, and then I switch to the next event and train that just like if I was there trying it. Um, that's really it, just a lot of different training from different angles, trying to keep it new and interesting and really work the muscles from different ways so they don't get, um, you know, it's not the same consistent pressure. It's different pressure. It's evolving. It's changing. It's always pushing me. Yeah, awesome. So do you have uh, any any particular numbers you want to hit at Legend? Anything in your mind? Um, for I, the um, the two and three eighths axle, I'm pretty confident I can hit a little over 300. I'd like to get in the 320 range. Um, Good number. For now the Saxon bar, I have no idea. I've pulled 202 or 204 on the Euro. That's about as far as I've gotten with it is anything similar to like a two inch pinch. Um, I have a three inch Saxon bar that I was able to do 185 on, so I'd like to at least beat 185, maybe get in the low 200s. But that's kind of the uh, the oddball, the the wild one for me. I don't really know where it's going to go. For grippers, I would like to um, do the 20 millimeter set with a 150 or 155. At uh, Gritmas, I did 145, so I'd like to step that up. And then, um, 
as far as all the numbers, uh, the anvil, I'm not really sure. I like to hit 200 on it. I haven't actually pulled with that implement, though. But um, Lucas made me a similar one, and I can pull 220 on it. So I'm hoping to get 200 on the one there. Yeah. So. Well, maybe you get 220 on the one there. Maybe. It it I mean, it all that. depends. Yeah. That's the thing. It's similar, but it's not the same. So I don't know if, like, this one is easier or that one's easier. I'm not sure the variance, if it's going to play in my favor or not. But if yeah. I can get over 200 on that one, I'll be happy. So one of the things that, you know, I like to remark about when it comes to Gary, just seeing him train and stuff, is that, you know, Gary's got an incredible pain tolerance. And I noticed last week, uh, listening to your to uh, Jed, you and Alan, your conversation with, um, with Don Cummings, you know, that, that one of the things that Don has, other than being, like, unbelievably just conditioned um, and, and driven, is, is an intense pain tolerance. You know, to, to, how, do you, how do you think you develop such a pain tolerance? And, 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 you know, having that pain tolerance, how much of your success do you attribute to it? Well, wrestling definitely paid – uh, played a big part in that. You got to be tough to be a wrestler. It hurts. You're going to go through so much pain. And I don't know, I was maybe 16 or 18, and I forgot exactly what happened. But I remember being in a lot of pain. It might have been my knee pain. I've been fighting knee problems my whole life. And I just, I made a agreement to myself that I would never stop because of pain. Like, I don't care how much it hurts. I'm going to keep pushing. I'm going to get through the pain. Pain is temporary, you know. Um, yeah. and bending hurts. Uh, one of my hashtags I use is, of course it hurts. Cause everybody asks me, doesn't that hurt? Yeah. It hurts like hell. It hurts my <laughs> wrist. It hurts my hands. It hurts my shoulders, but I'm not going to stop because of just pain. I'm going to keep going. If now, if you feel like a ligament pain or if you feel like it's about to dislocate or that type of pain, yeah, I'll stop. But if it's just skin pushing pain or, you know, just, when something tears or something's hurting, whatever, I'm not stopping. And if you watch some of my bending videos, a lot of them, I chest crush to get it down as far as I can, and then I pull the pads off and just grab the bar with my hands and squeeze it, that final crush. Yep. And that's yeah, just that. yeah, that's just pure pain tolerance, pure me being pissed off and going about it. Because I'm training myself, if I bend the gold and I get it down that close, if I pull it out the pads and it's not two inches, I'm not going to have time to rewrap it. I'm just going to grab it in my hands and just crush it. So that's what I'm training my hands to tolerate. Yeah. Wow. That's preparation. That, that is like next level thinking right there, bro. Holy cow. That, that blows yeah. me away. That's fantastic. I love it. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Gary. Gary is uh, methodical and scary. Yeah. And I have uh, OCD. <laughs> <laughs> rather than rather than scary Gary, Jason and I often refer to him as the Gare Bear. I don't know if we do it to his face. <laughs> oh, thanks. Do it to each other. Like, is the Gare Bear coming tonight? Kind of thing. So yeah. So, okay. Yeah. The one thing, the one thing not to mention on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, dude. Sometimes I forget. I think we have that conversation. <laughs> Should we should we tell them about chicken and dumplings, or is that definitely not for a podcast? Yeah, been, been there over. <laughs> <laughs> no one's gonna get that, and that's fine. All right, guys, any questions for Gary? Are you a are you a NASCAR racing fan, Gary? I am not. That is way too long. I do not have that attention span. Okay. All right. I ha I used to work at the racetrack selling newspapers just because I could make some money. But yeah, I I, I like to I, I kind of keep up with who's winning, but I cannot sit there and watch the race. Dude, I'm with you, man. I'm with you. I love drag racing, but NASCAR uh -uh, I can't do it. Yeah, yeah. drag racing is cool. Yeah. So, Gare, what are the uh, what are the goals? Because I mean, like a lot of people don't know that you know not only were you a wrestler and you know that you were in strongman and grip that. You know, I mean, we're planning on going out to lift the Denny Stones. I know that's one of your goals. But, but what are some of the other goals that you have? Um, well, the, the big one right now is, of course, the gold nail. 
Um, the Denny stones are up there. I'd love to try the real Husafell stone one day. Um, I want to compete in my first arm wrestling tournament pretty soon. I got to find somebody that's good at arm wrestling. Um, <laughs> but I, if it's if it's strenuous and painful, I'm into it. I uh, I train a little bit of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I just love testing myself and seeing what I can do, seeing what I can put myself through naturally, no steroids, no nothing like that, and just seeing what I can accomplish. I'll. I've tried just so much stuff just to check it off the bucket list that I've at least done it, you know. I've uh, competed like North Carolina's strongest man. I was a lot smaller than the open heavyweights, but on that day I stood there and I competed and I gave it my all, you know, and I can say I've done that. Sure. Yeah, that's awesome. That is awesome stuff. And also, I, I might add, not just planning to lift the Denny Stones, but to walk with them. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I can, uh, I'm pretty confident I can lift them. I've lifted more than that weight on a couple of different occasions. I want to be able to walk them across the bridge. Yeah, yeah. The whole width of the bridge? Yes. All right. Now, I don't, I'm comp- pretty confident that I can't do it in one motion. I saw the, uh, the show with Shaw and how far he walked them with just one pick up and go, but I would like to be able to, you know, pick them up, move them a foot, set them down, pick them up, move them a foot, set them down, just keep it going and get all the way across the bridge. Yeah, yeah. And also I'd like to mention, you know, Gary, uh, grip-wise, has pinched 245s. He's credit card set uh, lighter threes. So so Gary's a very versatile grip athlete as well. So just want to throw Tr- that out Trying there. to work on it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Trying to move Gary, up in the rankings. Gary. You know, kind of related to the to the bare handing, bare hand bending the gold at the end kind of thing. Just in case he's he's almost out of time and he doesn't have it crushed to, to two inches. None of us really look at the weather before we train at Bob's house. Gary will show up with a tent if there's <laughs> even a slight chance of rain. So, so kudos to Gary for always being prepared, always thinking a few steps ahead. Yeah. That was from uh, being a Boy Scout. I know how to pitch a tent and tie a knot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to touch that one. Oh, that's for another show. <laughs> <laughs> so I figured I figured this would be more Jed asking you questions about your wrestling career for, for a half hour. So I'll, I'll try not to bogart too much of this call. Yeah, I definitely do want to hear some more stuff about uh, wrestling, Gary. Uh, but does Alan have anything else for him as far as his uh, grip training and stuff? Well, yeah, so what other what other grip feats? What are your more notable ones? Have you have you lifted the inch? No, um, I can get it off the ground a little bit, but then it starts spinning. I've been doing um, a lot of dragging with it and sliding it and um, doing magnets. Um, I have picked up the man enough, but I'm part of the a more elite club that has picked up the man enough without any photographic evidence or video evidence. Uh, um, so sorry, God damn it, I'm sorry. So it's, uh, <laughs> I think it's me, me, Tim Butler, and one other guy have picked it up with no evidence, even though if you look at the guys that saw me do it, I don't think I could put together a better group of guys to witness it. Um, That's true. Trying to think of what else. Was I've, that a repeatable uh, feat for you, though, Gary? Is that something you can hit any day, or is that like a, you got it once and and it, it might be a while before you can can hit it again? That's how it is for me on a lot of things. I have that was the only day I've ever had access to it, and I got it once and held it and was happy and put it down. I tried to do it again, I couldn't get it off the ground. Okay, I'm it, 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 <laughs> it, uh, it cut you. the webbing of my. Yeah, it cut the webbing of my thumb on the way down, so that kind of killed that. But sure. I do want to give it another shot. What, if I remember correctly, and, of course, my memory again, but weren't the words that came out of your mouth when you had it uh, something like, James, is that camera running? James, can you go? Yeah. <laughs> James, can you go? Hey, James. James. <laughs> that, that, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Cause, cause, yeah. Cause, like, do I got it? Am I holding it? Are we on camera? Oh, wait, there's no camera. There's 15 of the top grip guys in the world staring at me. 
Well, I saw it, and Jed, you saw it too, I believe. Yes, so. I saw it. Yeah. I, I heard it and witnessed it. Yes, I was there. Alan it it was very it. easy. It looked very, very easy. One, probably one of the easiest lifts that I've seen of that implement. So, How could there not have been a camera rolling anywhere? I think that. I was well, in between feet or something like that. I was, yeah, no. I was taping a lot of stuff. But, uh, yeah, I think, you, hey, Jed, I think your camera was rolling, but somebody was in the way, or there's like a group of people in the way, because your camera was set up like 10 feet behind us when you were doing the um, the different blobs and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know how well, I, I ended up missing it, but it was, it, there was, you know, it could have been easily captured on, on uh, the other thing, dude, come on, dude, you got to, you gotta you gotta call your shot, you know. You gotta communicate a little bit too, okay? <laughs> oh yeah. Hey guys, well, I'm, I'm gonna I'm would... gonna go for this big ass feet here that only nine <laughs> ten people have done. Anybody got a camera on them? Well, you can uh, you can ask James about my track record with that. Um, I'm I'm one of those guys. I just grab it and go, kind of like how I was in strongman. Just grab it and pull like hell and see what happens. And I saw four, five, six other people not get it off the ground. And, you know, I didn't think I could do anything they couldn't do. So I was like, well, let me see how it feels. Let me get a hold of it. I didn't really prepare nothing, just grabbed it and picked it up. I'm like, oh, okay. Oh, wait, there's nobody filming. <laughs> <laughs> that was that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then we, a bunch uh, of people got it that day. Uh, I know I know Gil got Lucas it. Lucas did. Lucas. Did, uh, yeah. did Aaron get it? Aaron Corcoran? Uh, yes. I honestly I don't Aaron remember. Did, yeah. yeah, I believe Aaron got it. Oh, was this at Gripmas? I think he held it, too. This was at Gripmas, Alan, yeah. Okay. Yes. I sadly was not man enough again. So, <laughs> for, the, for the second time but, coming in contact with the man enough, I was not. <laughs> but you got it off the ground, though, right? Yeah, I did. I got it off the ground a couple of times. <laughs> So, I hate so that. Nate Browse is the owner of that, to, right? That's correct. That? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, that that was me with the 55s, if you recall, too, though, Gary, for about a year. Oh, yeah. I get them off the yeah. ground so much. It was unbelievable. I could just not lock them out. And then finally I yeah. did. And then I went like another year getting them off the ground and not locking them out until I finally did again. And then I was like, screw this. This is maddening. <laughs> so, <laughs> So yeah, the man enough is uh, is, uh, is is definitely on the list. I feel like it's yeah. in my sights if I see it again. I think if I had it yeah, for once, I'd pick it up. Now I'm currently fighting with the uh, half of a 120 iron grip, that big monster block. I can get that off the ground about a foot, but not a full lockout. I know I messaged yeah. uh, I think Jed about that a while ago because I built a. Uh, five and three quarter inch wood block to train for it and that that's another one i'm so close but it just it hasn't happened i've been going heavy on that for about the past eight months mm-hmm. yep <laughs> that's what i was talking about when we had juji mufu on jet how how gary built something to train for it and juji mufu walks over to it and picks it up with like three fingers and and just yeah like it you know just some weird awkward sort of lift it's just it's just crazy you know <laughs> i had that thing and that's it belongs to jason right gary yes yeah 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 i had it in my garage for so long and i was attempting it i was doing you know i was doing deloading with bands all kinds of stuff i couldn't lift it and and then J- juji mufu walks up to it and goes oh <laughs> just plops it off the <laughs> yeah so so yeah. Hey, that, so Gary, you're going to be arm wrestling. You just got to find somebody who knows how to do it, huh? Yeah, or maybe if there's a book or something, I could read that help too. <laughs> Good luck with that. I think uh, I think Ernie Jeffries wrote uh, wrote a book about it in the '70s. I can see if I can find that for you. Oh, and, okay. Uh, as far as as far as extremely knowledgeable arm wrestlers in the area, I know there's a guy named Paul Walther. So you can. Look <laughs> <laughs> that's a joke only you're going to get yeah well, so speaking of people you can't understand exactly <laughs> oh gosh don't get it started on people you can't understand man oh uh, let's get started 
<laughs> yes. Yeah, just uh, <laughs> well, just training with you and training with some of the other arm wrestlers. Arm wrestling is just a whole thing to itself. It's so much involved in just what you're doing on the table and hand placement, elbow placement, even feet placement. It's a whole world to itself. So I don't, I don't want to focus that much on it. I don't think I can really get into everything, but I would love to be able just to pull and do good in a novice tournament. And there's, um, I think one coming up in Charlotte in January, I'm eyeballing. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know when it is. I know I'm supposed to be announcing that one. Um, I think, yeah, it's December or January. Yeah. So, so we got time to get you ready for that. All right. Now that I'm, uh, I've completed, you know, my arduous mission to my 150 pound preacher curl, I'll, uh, I'll oh, be yes. able to arm wrestle here and there. So I don't have to, you know, so I don't, it doesn't matter if I have tendon pain all week. So, so I'll, yeah, uh, that, that was nuts. Talking about, uh, feats of the week or uh, feats that are done, 150 on a preacher curl one-handed is insane. Thanks, man. Yes, I appreciate congratulations, that. James. I, I was going to catch that right away, and then we, we missed it. So, yeah, 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 thanks. Huge congrats. Thank you, You much. know what? You made that look easy, though, dude. What have you been waiting yeah. on all this time exactly? <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Gary, how many times did I fail at 149? Oh, wow. <laughs> There's what? Four, five, six, I remember. Yeah, yeah. Because I would always tell these guys, like, oh, I failed at 149 point whatever again. You know, so yeah. So what I did was I, I did all my training cycles to, the, to you know, with between, uh, well, I've been doing Wendler lately, and I worked it up to, like, 151.7 was my last training cycle through that. And, you know, when I got to uh, – the five three one week, I just took a week off, and I was like, you know what, I'm going for this. I'm going for all one fifty, and and yeah, I guess I was just, uh, I don't know, like one fifty one definitely felt popular. I mean, possible. We'll put it that way. But but uh, yeah, I'm going to take a break from those. I'm just, you know, the the sleepless nights for the next couple of nights afterwards because of the tendon pain, and yeah, I don't, I don't know. I just, I don't want to be too crippled when I get older. <laughs> just a little crippled. So what do you what do you do from here with this, James? What's your next? Uh, now that you hit the 150, what are you after? Well, I'm gonna. Um, I, I Jason actually, it's funny because Jason put the lever top into um, the uh, event that we're having, the 21st. Um, I I just I just trained it a little bit this week. It's the first time I've done it in a very long time. Um, and David Horn has got the record in that. I think it's like. 103 point something pounds. So I'd like to uh, set the record on that, if possible, uh, September 21st. And um, I think I'm in Jed's camp where I'd like to uh, get a good strict curl with a 100 pound dumbbell. Because I remember Rob Vigent uh, making that uh, challenge to people years ago. And I worked up in the 96 point something range and, and then backed off him. Uh, after I had my car accident. So I'd like to get back into that and focus on those as my primary bicep exercise and see if I can get up to 100 pounds. So, James, oh, sure. why, yep. why do you want to curl so heavy, bro? Why so heavy? I, you, know, it's, you know, it's weird. It's kind of a long story, but I, I'll give you it as quick as I possibly can. Years ago, I heard about a power lifter named Dan Shaw. Mm-hmm. who was a drug-free power lifter who was able to curl a 120-pound dumbbell on a preacher bench. Mm-hmm. And I remember because I had just started arm wrestling, and um, I had a preacher bench in, at, at my house, and I was like, let me, let me just see what I can do. This is like, you know, I mean, I'm whatever. I was 20 years old at the time. And I went to uh, Played Against Sports in Milford, Connecticut, and I – I bought a few hex dumbbells. I bought a 50-pound one, a 65, a 75, a 90, a 100, and a 120. And the 120 was like actually weighed out 123 points something. So, so I was like, well, you know, that's my goal is that dumbbell. I'll do that dumbbell someday. So then, of course, I went home, and I couldn't even do it with the 50-pound hex, you know. <laughs> so, 
So what I did, though, was I included preacher curling into my arm wrestling workout. And I realized that more than even doing table curls, that full range preacher curls tended to help me in a hook. When I started training them, I, the, the group of guys I trained with, some of them I was very close to uh, uh, in a hook, but I would lose to them. And shortly after I started getting better at preacher curling, I realized that I could beat those guys in a hook all of a sudden. So I just kind of included it as part of my arm wrestling training. And then uh, before the Nationals in 2008 was the first time I was able to do that 120-pound hex dumbbell. And, uh, you know, and then I, I, I lost some weight. I, I, I didn't really make any gains in that for a while. Then I stopped arm wrestling in 2012, and I was like, yeah, you know, I mean, I don't have all that tendon pain that I had from arm wrestling. Let me see what I could do on this preacher bench. I don't know. It just became part of my workout, and I got sort of fixated on it. So, so it's like, you know, I mean, I, I, was, I grew up so skinny and scrawny and weak, you know, and couldn't beat anybody at arm wrestling. So it was, I don't know, it was kind of cool for me to, to choose something that I wasn't good at and wasn't strong at and then, you know, gradually go through the process of feeling inferior and not doing well at something and, you know, losing twice at a tournament and then, you know, coming back and trying again and, and gradually getting to a point where I attained a level of, of mastery at it, you know. And, you know, it, it really gives you a blueprint for anything at life, like, you know, just keep pressing and, you know, try to do it smart. And if you don't give up, you'll get there kind of thing. So, so yeah, but 150 was, yeah, 150 was kind of a, a thought I had in 2012. Like, could I ever get there kind of thing? And, and, you know, at first it was like, well, 130 seems impossible because it was, took me so long to get there. And then somehow between 130 and 140 went quickly and then one, 140 to 148 went relatively quickly. And then 148 to 150 took me two years. So, so you know. Wow. But, yeah, I want to back off it. You know, I don't, I don't really feel like I have anything else to prove to myself with those. So. Yeah. But if you score a 150-pound oh, York, you're going you're gonna to curl that one? I don't know. <laughs> I already started losing weight, you know. I think maybe if I did get my hands on one, I would. Just so, okay. you know, yeah. Just so there wasn't uh, any questions. But then now it's like, you know, everyone's saying that those legacy bells tend to weigh light. So, you know. But, no, I'm, I'm happy with the curl that I did. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy with the range of motion. Like you said, Alan, like I was actually surprised it, it came up as easy as it did in, in certain spots. I have, I have a certain sticking spot that I thought was going to be a bigger battle than it was, but, you know, it came up. So, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of satisfied. So it's uh, lever top world record, then, uh, you know, maybe a 100-pound bicep curl with uh, pretty strict form. I don't know if I'll do it with my back against the wall or whatever, but, 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 but you know, a, a form strict enough so that I'm okay with it. We'll put it that way. And then uh, yeah, people are going to complain about your form regardless, right. you know, so, so it's like whatever. But, uh, but, but, you know, that I'm okay with. If I'm okay with the form, then, you know, then I'll move on to something else. And, you know, it, 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 the interesting thing is, is, I mean, I train everything. I don't just have bicep goals. It's just that my biceps have gotten, <laughs> gotten stronger than everything else pretty much. So, sure. Yeah. Hope that answers your question, Jed. I know that was a roundabout way of doing it. No, I like it. I think we're going into the details. It's cool to hear all that and, you know, a bit of the, the journey as well. So thanks for yes. the details. Um, it's been a hell of a journey. Yeah, man, for sure. Uh, Gary, go back to you for a minute. Yeah. Um. You know, a lot of people, I think, still believe that uh, pro wrestling is just, uh, it's only a show and not really that much skill involved. So I, w I would want to talk a little bit about the um, introductory training uh, to becoming a pro wrestler, if, you, if we could, if you don't mind. 
All right, which uh, aspect? The the pain right. part, the bumping, the running? Yeah, well, a little bit of all of it. So first off, what is the – how long is the training period for the average professional wrestler before they even get into a ring in, in, at, a, at a reputable school? Not someone – because we know that there's schools out there that they'll, like, get you in a ring too early sometimes – but let's say on average a reputable school, how long does it take for someone to get into um, – to go through enough basic information to be able to put – to be put into a match in front of people? Um, I would say about six months to a year, depending on the school and the person. Some people simply pick it up quicker than others. Uh, some people have physical or mental issues they need to overcome. Like um, taking an over bump where you pretty much do a front flip and land on your back. A lot of people have a problem mentally with doing that motion. You have to overcome that. Um, so I've seen really good people come in and six, eight months later, they're in the ring working an opening match. Some people I've seen train two years and not get into a match. But generally I would say around a year. Um, but I still consider people a rookie up until two years. Just because there's, even when you're working an opening match, there's still so much psychology and so much in the ring and so much you need to learn and how to read the crowd and how to work the crowd and how to cover up your mistakes and how to um, convey your emotions and how to do promos. And just because you can work, you know, they call it curtain jerk and work in the first couple matches, just because you can work a match does not make you a, a really professional wrestler. You got to, because you act differently in training than you do in a match. Training, it's not the same atmosphere. So once you get trained and you get ready to go, it doesn't mean you're going to make a good match. I've seen guys that in training they're great, but then they go out in front of the crowd and completely freeze up. They don't know what to do. They forget everything. Mm. So it's once you start working a match, you're still training. You're still a rookie, even though you're allowed to work a match. And a true professional, you're always learning. You're always working on stuff. You're always trying to progress. I know guys that have been, at, been in it 10 or 15 years, and they're still learning new stuff. There's so much you can do, and there's so much of how the sport evolves. Like if you watch tapes back from the 50s and the 60s, and then there's a big jump in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s, and then how acrobatic they are today, it's, there's just such a wide range of stuff you can learn, you can progress, and you can keep trying new things, you know? Absolutely. Um, so I think that's I think that's pretty eye-opening for most people. I would think most I – th- I know that most people think you only go for like a few weeks and then you're ready to wrestle. So to hear that it's at minimum six months and sometimes up to a year, two years – that's got to that's got to be eye opening to some people hearing this. What about this, man? Um, I was blown away. I went to one training session in 2015. It was uh, or maybe 2016. It was right before I got my sinuses done. I was thinking about joining a school. You and I talked about that. You told me some yeah. of the conditioning that I could work on uh, in a gym or even out in the lawn in order to uh, you know get prepared for that. Never ended up doing a session myself because I had to get my sinuses scraped, and they said if I got hit in the nose after that, I could die, and then I never ended up going down. But um, one of the things that was extremely eye-opening to me was the footwork requirement for even some of the basic holds like tie-ups and things like that. So could you talk about that a little bit, maybe give an example or two, and, and how big the footwork is, like the foot placement? Oh, yeah. Well, in that aspect, it's kind of like dancing, but I hate calling it dancing because there's so much more involved. But if, you, if you're not on the same page footwork, if somebody's not properly trained, you're going to step on each other's toes, literally. Um, so the first thing is to make sure everybody knows where to put your feet so you're not literally stepping on anybody else's toes. And once you start moving and running and going into and off the ropes, then if your feet are moving, you're going to trip the other person if you collide. So you got to know how to run right. you got to know how to whip people right and um, where to place your feet. 
And then when you get into learning how to bump and how to work around somebody, you don't want to step on their hands, their arms, their face. So where you put your feet and how your foot works with the other person in the ring is a big deal. You know, you can crush somebody's face or crush somebody's fingers. Um, you can trip. You can fall out the ring. If you're running into the ropes and you turn your legs wrong and you trip, you could go through the ropes and land on your head on the outside of the ring. So you got to learn how to turn and have your feet right when you go into the ropes so that way you'll come back off of them and you're, a you're able to step and continue that run. If you put the wrong foot forward coming off the rope, you could lock your knee up and blow out your knee. So it is, it is something you have to learn and slowly progress from just how to place it in the lockup to how to hold that lockup and move with the person and then start running in the ring and then taking bumps and working around the person. It's a it's a big progression you have to learn while you're learning the moves too. Um, yeah, like so the practice I went to, one a guy that I've known for probably – it was probably eight years at the time, and I, I know that he was wrestling for at least five of those years. So this guy, uh -huh. he worked at the same plant I used to work in when I when I had a a, a regular job at the beef plant. So okay. I went down there, didn't know he was going to be there, but he ended up being there. And he said that he learned stuff about foot placement for what I'm going to call chain moves, like a series of moves yes. that are done over and over. He learned stuff that practice after being involved for five years that he said he had never heard before. So, oh yeah. And I always thought when when I saw him wrestle in like just the local um, promotions that are around here, I always like I always thought that he looked like he was out of place, like lumbering around or something like that. And I was like, well, maybe that's why. Like someone missed something or he forgot or he wasn't doing something right because you could see that it was like almost impeding the flow of the match when he was when he was working. Oh, okay. So yeah, chain wrestling, if you look back at like the fifties and the sixties, um, even into the seventies, they did a lot more chain wrestling than we do today. Mm -hmm. Um today right. it's a lot of power moves and a lot of acrobatic stuff. But chain wrestling, it's closer to legit, like high school wrestling. You're always in contact with the person. You're always moving. You're doing a lot of reverses. Um, that is really technical and really more complicated. It's harder to do a five-minute chain wrestling match than it is to do a five-minute brawl or a match where you're just slamming somebody. So if you're a really good technical wrestler and you go to a place and somebody can't keep up with you, it's going to look – really awkward in the ring and you're trying to right. roll and do these moves and reverses and the, the other guy can't keep up with you. Yeah, yeah. Is that something where schools differ? And if you end up having to work with someone that's from a different school, like you, you might end up having some difficulties? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, just to – like, there's a hundred different schools, but let's let's talk about, like, bigger names. Like, let's say if you get trained by Dean Malenko versus if you get trained by Bret Hart versus if you get trained by Brock Lesnar. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Dean Malenko can teach you volumes about chain wrestling and actually doing moves and submissions and holds. Right. Brock Lesnar is going to teach you how to, you know, suplex somebody and punch somebody in the face. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if you, when you, when you get out on the indie scene, you never really know who trained a lot of people. They could be self-taught. They could have just watched a lot of stuff on TV. They could be trained in a backyard. They could have been trained by Harley, Harley Race, who, uh, you know, just passed away. Yeah. I mean, you, you never really know when I've had certain matches that have led to a full fight because of that. Wow. You know, somebody gets into the ring. I mean, somebody, you're, you're risking your life in that match, you know, if, you, if you're going to suplex me and you don't know how to do it, you could break my neck. Mm -hmm. So if I get into the match with you and you're trying to pull something on me, I'm not happy about it because now my life is in danger. Right. So I'm going to protect myself, and if that means knocking you out, I'm going to knock you out and finish the match, and I'm going, I'm going to walk home, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, yeah, one, more, one, 
one, just one more question, and then I'll hand it back over to the other guys. If you could touch on some of that pain tolerance stuff, Gary, like talk about some of the basic stuff that really, really hurts, and not just like the conditioning that burns and like makes you think you're going to die, but like some of the stuff that really produces honest to god pain that most people will have no idea how much it hurts. Just give a couple examples. I'm sure there's many. I know. All I'm right. Thinking about um, well, the the most common one that people see and people assume it's fake is the steel chair shot to the head. Okay. Uh, let me tell you, the chairs are real. Um, back in the day, WCW, when they tried hardcore, they tried a rubber chair, and it looked like garbage. Oh. So WWE and all the independents, they actually use the same steel chairs that you're sitting on in the crowd, and they hurt. It rings your head, it bends the chair, You sometimes you'll see a flash of silver, sometimes you'll see a flash of black. Um, I've had a few concussions, I've had chairs bend over my head. That is absolutely not fake, and it absolutely hurts. But you, uh, you do get used to it, you build up a harder head. You can't actually build up a thicker forehead. They've done uh, like uh, MRIs of certain wrestlers, and their skulls are thicker because of what they've done. Um, ken- kendo sticks sting a lot more than you would realize, more than the average person would realize. Um, if they hit across your back, they can cut you open. They sting really bad. And if somebody doesn't know what they're doing and they decide to hit you on the head, it can it feels like it's splitting your skull. Mm. And I had one guy hit me directly over the head. It broke the stick, and the stick hit me, hit me in the back. So if you watch the video, it hits my head, bends and breaks, and slaps me in the back at the same time. So that was a that was a fun incident. Um, <laughs> falling falling on the floor hurts if there's no padding out there, and like if you watch some like the older NWA stuff and they have the concrete around the ring, um, the guys they take a bump, they just fall, they get thrown on the concrete, and it doesn't look that bad, but it hurts a lot worse than it looks. You're literally getting slammed on concrete. Mm-hmm. Um, what about the and ropes? Of course, the, I, I've heard like just running the ropes like the first day is like extreme pain. Or it might not be the first day, dude. I, I don't know what goes on the first day. But no. like in the duct well, introductory the, phases. Yeah, um, depending on the school and where you go, you might not be allowed in the ring for the first couple months. Yeah. Some places they'll put you in the ring the first day just to break you, basically to see how much you can take. Mm-hmm. Um, but running the ropes, it puts a lot of pressure on your lats and right under your arms as you're learning how to turn. Mm-hmm. If you go sideways into the rope and it hits your armpit, there's like a ball of nerves in your armpit, and it really hurts. So you have to learn how to turn your back to the ropes. Mm. But the the ropes can vary depending on the ring and the promoter and the federation. Some places it's steel cable with PVC pipe put over it. There's absolutely no cushioning. Um, other places actually use rope, and it is softer. Mm-hmm. Some places use cable and then wrap like pipe wrap and duct tape on it to give you some cushioning. So it it does depend on where you're wrestling, but yeah, you have to get used to that. You have to build up your upper back to um, to take that pressure of being whipped into the rope repeatedly. And during training, you might run back and forth for five or ten minutes straight. It's Dude. the same as like running a mile or two outside, but you're just going back and forth twenty feet at a time. And every time you run twenty feet, you get whipped on the back. <laughs> Yes, dude. You told me about that when uh, when I was thinking about joining that school, and, and it was just like mind mind blowing thinking about that because that's literally that's literally a mile run that you're accomplishing inside of a you know 16 to 20 foot distance, bouncing back and forth against ropes. That's it's yeah. crazy. People must get sick turning changing directions like that, don't they? Oh yeah, it'll mess with your equilibrium and trying to keep your balance because you're. You're spinning and spinning and spinning, and when you get into doing over bumps, as I was talking before, if you you have to get used to that motion. The first couple times you do it, you kind of jump up and you're dizzy. Um, you you get used to it, you build up a tolerance to it, you learn to expect it. But some places 
they want you to get sick. They want to push you to that point. They want to break you to see how you're going to react. If you're wrestling a match and you get exhausted to the point you're going to pass out, are you going to throw up? Are you going to lay down and quit? Are you going to pass out? Are you going to cry and go home? What are you going to do when you get to that point? Are you going to suck it up and finish the match? Right. So some places, I've seen places push you that far on the first day just to see what type of person you are. But definitely before you're in a real show, you need to be pushed to that point just so you know what's going to happen when you get there. Awesome, man. You know? Dude, I could talk about this with you all day, but I know that not everybody wants to hear about it. So, um, thank yeah. you for going over those details. I've been meaning to ask that stuff for a while, and I was really excited when James said you were coming on the show. So appreciate you going over that stuff as well. I'll turn it back over no. to Alan and James now. I actually don't have anything else, so whatever James has got. Oh, no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly all questioned out with Gary. Um, you know, I, I'd just like to add, it's been a pleasure training with Gary over the years and, and, and getting to know him. He's, a, he's about as solid a dude as you're going to meet. So, so I'm a big Gary well, Stewart fan. Well, thank you. I appreciate you uh, bringing me in to the uh, Charlotte Pickup Artists and having me on today, Jed and Alan. Uh, I listened to the cast. I was excited when I got the opportunity. And I, you know, I love talking about wrestling and grip and all kind of things. So I think it worked out. Yeah, it's, I think and it's kind also, of surprising how many like former pro wrestlers are actually involved in like grip and strongman performances. Because like, right off the top of my head, I know uh, Iron Tamer Dave Whitley used to be a pro wrestler, and um, John Mauser either was or oh, yeah. may, may still be a pro wrestler uh, on occasion. So. Uh, and there could be more that I'm forgetting about right now, but there's there's a decent amount. There's I think there's more I think there's more pro wrestlers, you know, trained pro wrestlers than like doctors. That's for sure. So. <laughs> that's it. Well, yeah, I know uh, I know Gary and I, as of yesterday, became the tag team, the uh, the Thick Squad. <laughs> I saw that. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I saw that. Poor life. Yeah, and it just so happened that Kapusa showed up yesterday, and so did Pork Chop and Jason. So it was like Bob and the Thick Squad. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of, there was a lot of that. Hand. Speaking of that, one thing I was going to bring up a while ago is the the Simpsons uh, caricature that somebody did for you guys. I don't think we ever ended up talking about that. What can you tell us? About that? What? You didn't see that, well, that Alan? Was Jason's idea. No. <laughs> There was was a guy, I don't know who it was, James could tell us, but there's a guy who does caricatures in a style of Simpson characters. He mainly was doing them for uh, arm wrestlers, I believe. Luke got one made, and then then the the crew in Charlotte got one done, too. It It was posted all over social media, Alan. Thanks for being prepared. That's three strikes for you today, Alan. That's three strikes. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, Jason Jason had it it was Jason's idea. And um you know, the day that we did it well Gary had the best idea. Gary's like, You gotta put that chalk bag in the middle there so it looks like a chalk <laughs> bag is okay. So, <laughs> so and Gary to me, I don't know. To me, Gary's the only one that looks like Gary. But but most people I show it to Ha- will say that that the James character looks like me. Some people will confuse me and Jason. I couldn't tell which one was you and which one was Jason. I really, I really couldn't tell. It stumped me, bro. And look at Bob. Bob looks like Clark Gable in that picture. Yeah. Somehow, I mean, yeah. It looks like a movie. Well, I star. think Bob looks like Clark Gable, though. Well, okay. Well, good point. Never mind. That's I've you know? I've, I've described Bob as the Clark Gable of grip like a hundred times. <laughs> Well there, you go. <laughs> well, there you go. And Gary looks like Gary. So, so you know. But it's a funny picture. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, y'all didn't tell me to wear a white shirt and shorts that day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I don't think I've ever seen you in a white shirt. I don't have – I got one white shirt because the Iron Mind sent me one when I bent the red nail. That's the only white shirt I got. Yeah, and you never wear it either. Yeah, you know, that's actually a really nice shirt. I, I have one. Well, mine's the the crush to dust one. They just sent me for being a ref, and I really like the shirt. Actually, it fits good. It seems to be a high quality. 
You don't like oh, it? Okay, nice. I just I just don't wear white. <laughs> oh, sure, okay. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, black looks good with everything. So I have you know a hundred black shirts, and I got I got a green one now. I wore a green one Saturday after the thick squad shirt. That's true. That's true. The thick squad shirt, uh, it got a little wet, got a little sweaty. <laughs> yeah, a little humid. Yeah. But the uh, the Simpsons warm. thing was, going back to the Simpsons thing, uh, the first edition of it didn't include my chain tattoos, so Jason had to send it back and have them add my chain tattoos. <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. That's like not putting your head on, bro. That's like leaving right. leaving your head off. Well, <laughs> go, doing uh, doing the grip competitions and meeting some of the people, I have been recognized by my forearms before my face. People people literally said, "Oh, I recognize your chains. I recognize your forearms." Yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> it's claim to fame. Well, I don't have a question got for Mister Gary. I don't know what else you guys got. No, I well, covered everything. I covered everything. Thanks a lot for being on, Gary. Appreciate it. Oh, uh, thank you for having me. It was uh, great talking to you again. And I am absolutely down for a chop off when we go to uh, where are we going? Where is it? Living Legend. <laughs> yeah. No, just, uh, just, just don't. Whatever you do, don't hit Jed in the nose because you might kill him. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're we're, we're not going to trade Jed. chair shops. It'll be all right. Yeah, no chair <laughs> shots, dude. I, I'm not. I yeah, I'm I'm not uh, totally dumb, but I'll I'll do a chop off. I'll do a chop off. All right, sounds great. All right, thanks. All right, well, Alan, it's your show, dude. Take it away, brother. All right, well, that's it for episode 105 of this week in grip. Hope everybody liked it. Hey, Gary, thanks one more time for coming on. This was a lot of a lot of fun. I really like this. So, uh, <laughs> everybody, yeah, thanks for having me. I, I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, Make sure you guys like, share, and subscribe. Comment down below, and we'll be back next week with another one. See you later.